My God loves me And all the wonders I see The rainbow shines through There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it a 
far, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and our spirits shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore hi my name is gail reiner and I have been a nurse for 45 years. This is my dear friend, Landani Sabanda. She has, after she was a teacher, been a nurse for 35 years. And we have uh, become friends ever since she was my nurse in the oncology unit at UCSD Thornton Hospital in La Jolla when I was in treatment for ovarian cancer in 2004. So it's a miracle story and we're very grateful for our ongoing friendship. And I've played a minor role with um, my husband and friends in helping to support a clinic that she's now running back in her home country in Zimbabwe. And we hope that you'll join us because um, we have a lot of fun. Yes, we do. The morphine miracle. <laughs> the morphine miracle. <laughs> so thank you for um, joining in our, in our effort to serve some of the most underserved people in the world that uh, really appreciate your remembrance. Good evening, Sali Bonani. My name is Lengiwe Lindani Sibanda. I'm a nurse practitioner, retired. I've been working with South Bay since 2005 because of my beautiful friends. I have just retired from my nurse practitioner job in New Mexico where I worked with Indian Health Services. I'm back in Zimbabwe running a clinic that we had been building for the past two years. It's up and running now, God has blessed us. And thank you so much for your support, South Bay. In the clinic that we have, we see patients from age zero to 101. Our oldest patients literally is 101 years old. We also see a gamut of diseases from high blood pressure, diabetes, seizures, HIV, TB, we see people with skin issues, we see people who have been hurt in accidents, we see people who have cirrhosis because we do have people who drink alcohol there. So we have been busy with four staff members, two registered nurses, nurses eight, a receptionist five, plus the doctor who comes in every Wednesday when his day is really busy. The average number of patients we see is about five, six, because we literally just started. But when it's busy, it's very busy. And we're grateful for that. And we also have needs because we just started. People we, we have in the surrounding areas do not have money. So transportation is an issue for them. We need housing for our staff. Right now, the staff that we have shares one, one, one house 
with two bedrooms, no running water, no electricity. So we're in the process of trying to build housing for them so that they can be comfortable and well rested when they come to work. We also have needs for medications. We have to buy the medications, it's not free. Our clinic is not free anymore. You'll remember before when we used to run free clinics, we don't anymore. And we have needs for a car. The roads have been so bad. My car gets smacked every time I have to run on that road. It's so painful. So at some point, I'm sure someone will be kind enough to donate enough money just for us to buy a decent car to run up and down to take patients to the hospital, the very sick ones, because some of them we cannot manage at the clinic. So for that reason, we're appealing to you, South Bay, with your friends and family to say there's a clinic in Zimbabwe is Christian-based. Actually, we start with every day with a word of prayer so that we can get wisdom and guidance from God. So we're up and running. We know you'll be running with us in this journey. It's fascinating, it's challenging. It's a good way to serve God, and I'm grateful to be part of that journey with you. May God bless you, and we love you for what you do. See you later. One day, 13-year-old Jared read a story about a boy named Wilford who liked to surprise people with gifts. He wrapped up gifts, tied them to a rope, and lowered them over people's walls. Then he ran and hid. Jared thought it would be fun to do the same thing in his home of Takmak, Kyrgyzstan. He asked his mom for permission to put gifts in old tissue boxes. What kind of gifts? She asked. Some toys and whatever else I can find, Jared said. His mom liked the idea. Jared and his younger brother Sam had cars and Legos that they had brought along when their family moved from Argentina to serve as volunteers in Kyrgyzstan. Many neighborhood boys were poor and didn't have toys. Jared told his school friend, Camille, about the plan. Let's put some toys in boxes and throw them over walls, he said. Camille grinned in excitement. He thought it was a great idea and he wanted to help even though he didn't have any toys to give away. The boys took two tissue boxes and filled them with Legos, toy cars, scarves, and bars of soap. Getting on their bikes, they rode to Camille's neighborhood and chose two houses at random. Jared hurled the first box over one fence, and Camille threw his over the other fence. Quickly, the boys pedaled away. At Jared's house, they laughed as they imagined the surprise of the children who had received the gifts. Sam, Jared's brother, overheard the laughter. Can I join you next time? He asked. A few days later, the three boys got together to prepare more gifts. They invited another boy from school, Kozenbeck, to join them. The boys filled two shoe boxes, two empty tissue boxes, and two plastic bags with a variety of toys, scarves, and soap. Loading the boxes on their bikes, they set off in search of unsuspecting homes. After a few minutes, Jared saw a house surrounded by a fence. The yard was filled with trees. Sam, he said, throw your bag into that yard. Sam tossed the bag over the fence and it landed in the lower branches of a tree. Quick, do something, Sam squealed. Camille was the tallest, so he leaped over the fence. Reaching up into the branches, he grabbed the bag and dropped it on the grass. Let's go before anyone sees us, he shouted. The boys raced away on their bikes. After throwing four more gifts over fences, the boys had one box left. Jared spotted a house with a large metal gate. Quick, push the gift under the gate, he told Kozenbeck. As soon as Kozenbeck pushed the box under the gate, someone yelled, why are you putting garbage in my yard? As the boys quickly rode away, they heard the voice suddenly exclaim from behind the gate, this isn't garbage, it's a gift. During family worship that evening, Jared and Sam excitedly told their parents about what had happened. Their dad was pleased. He led the family in prayer for all the people who had received the gifts. Jared and Sam are still throwing surprise boxes over people's fences. No one knows that they are responsible, and that's how they want it.
protector llenas mi corazón con cánticos de liberación de angustia me guardarás confiaré church family. I'm so glad that I am able to be with you guys in your living rooms and bedrooms or wherever you are um, at this time. I hope that this morning is good. I hope that you feel blessed. Um, please continue to share and like and share with as many people as possible. I firmly believe that online ministry is our next move just to reach as many people as we possibly can and just sharing the good news. But before we get started today, I just want to have a prayer with you and we'll jump right in. Dear Heavenly Father God, I just want to thank you again for today. Thank you for those who are hearing the sound of my voice, God. I ask that you 
a special blessing on them and their families and everyone that they extend to and further on and god i ask that they may have a shining light or that they may know that they have a shining light in their hearts and that's you and that others may see it and others may know you through them dear lord i ask that you be the guiding teacher today that you open our hearts and minds that we are able to receive your word and uh, we love you so much in your name jesus i pray amen so the verse i wanted to read with you guys or the verse that i was inspired by this week is found in second corinthians so if you want to turn there it's second corinthians chapter four and it i believe it's verse eight it's eight nine eight and nine and it says we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned struck down but not destroyed that is Paul, and he's writing this letter to the church in Corinth. And he's saying that they're in a difficult situation, right? There's something's going on. They're, they're experiencing some sort of hardship. But instead of dwelling on that hardship, he's saying, but, you know, at least we're not dead, sort of thing, right? We are pressed on every side, you know, pressure, feeling this pressure on every side, but they're not crushed perplexed but not in despair they're not hopeless persecuted right persecuted but not abandoned struck down but not destroyed what is it like to live that way to actually walk by faith and knowing who your father is and knowing you have such authority that nothing can destroy you, not even death. The reason I say this is because we just, together, we had this pandemic. And I think it was really hard for people who tend to want to be in control. For lack of a better word, control freaks, right? If you're a control freak, I think that this pandemic must have been really, really hard for you. And I think change in any dynamic or circumstance that we may be in for us, because I, I can be a control freak. I like to be in control. I like to know what's going to happen. But when I'm not, that's when my test of faith jumps in, right? Do I really live by faith or is it just when it benefits me that I live by faith, right? And I think that this was tested. Um, uh, many of us, maybe you live alone. Maybe you didn't have any social interaction. Maybe you live with a bunch of family. You didn't have any privacy. You know, there's so many different circumstances that people experienced over this past year and so forth. But what was, what was the positive? right we're praying right where when it happened i found myself when it happened you know i was working a lot and i didn't really have a direction in which i was going but when it happened i um at first i was you know like terrified you know how am i gonna get paid how am i gonna pay my bills you know when's my next job like what's going to happen i had no control of the situation and I was praying that it would end, right? I was praying, you know, that this pandemic end. But during the pandemic, you know, you got comfortable maybe, at least I did. I got comfortable, you know, it's not so bad being at home or working from home. I had different opportunities open up, you know, working for South Bay opened up for me, you know, so many different doors, you know, God really did continue to provide for me. But then I found myself not wanting for it selfishly, not wanting the benefits of the pandemic to end. So I was praying for it to end, but then I found myself wanting to stay in it. And that reminded me of the Israelites, you know, they wanted to be liberated from Egypt. They wanted freedom, right? You want this certain freedom and 
God liberated them. They go to the wilderness and they're walking or going towards the promised land. And all of a sudden, they want to be back in Egypt because, you know, they missed the food there. They didn't appreciate what they had until it was gone. You know, we're, we're these creatures of habit. We're, we're creatures of control. But God, when we enter into a new life, you know, a new heart, a new creation in which he has made us, that control, we no longer have it. But we can live in peace knowing who we belong to. That is what it looks like to live by faith. It's kind of like rolling with the punches. It's kind of like looking at the positives when we're in bad circumstances, right? We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. How often is it that when you're in a difficult situation that you're like, but at least I have, but at, you know, at least this is going for me. How hard is it when we live in a society that's so woe is me? It's, it's hard, you know, it's hard if we're still living as we were not born again, right? But we have been born again. We have been liberated from our dead bodies and we rise to newness in Christ. Why is it that we keep wanting to go back to Egypt? We've been liberated from Egypt because freedom that we are not in control of is uncomfortable and familiar bondage is comfortable. I'm going to say that again. Freedom in which you are not in control of is uncomfortable, but familiar bondage is much more comfortable. That's why people, you know, addiction, when, when someone is struggling with addiction, right? It is way easier to stay addicted because you're comfortable. It makes you feel good. Then to go through the difficulties of weaning yourself off from that addiction. Your body literally goes through this, this longing, you know, it gets physically sick. Freedom, no one ever said freedom was comfortable. <laughs> but the reward is way greater than we could imagine. And, and the reason I say this is, is because we are being called to let go. And, and, you know, I'm speaking to myself at this point. We are being called to let, literally let go. Let go of everything. Because when we die to ourselves and rise in the newness of Christ, our life is no longer ours. It is, belongs to him. So um, I heard, um, or I had hurt my, my elbow, right? I had hurt it in jujitsu. And a PT friend of mine, he does physical therapy. He said, you have a golfer's elbow. And I was like, what? Like, I've never played golf in my life. What do you mean I have golfer's elbow? You, you're going to have to break that down for me. You're going to have to explain that to me, right? And, um, you know, what have you been doing? And, you know, I've been, I've been explaining, you know, I've been lifting heavier weights so I can get stronger. Um, and I think it might be the weights. I might be lifting too much, right? But then he said something. He said, it's not that you're lifting too much. Your grip is too tight and it's causing you to hurt. My, and he said, if you loosened your grip, you would actually be able to lift more. And that for me kind of nailed it in the coffin. My grip on my life and the way that I want it to go and the life of faith that I want to live, it's too tight. And because it's too tight, I'm hurting myself because I'm not trusting God. I'm not looking at the positives and I'm not living by faith. We are called to literally let go, loosen your grip, and you're going to be able to lift a lot more. The reward is way greater. 
So <clears throat> the verse I had read of Paul, I'm going to read it again. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Why is Paul able to live that way? Why he literally lives that way, right? Paul is in so many different situations. If you guys are not familiar with Paul, Paul um, is it was chosen by God to spread the good news, and throughout the New Testament, he's constantly in these circumstances that's compromising his life. He's constantly facing death right and when he's facing death and it's most of the times so that he's in prison or about to be persecuted you know he's writing letters of encouragement he's writing that he is so sure of his place in life right <clears throat> he knows who he belongs to but why why well if we give it some context and we go back to second corinthians same chapter, chapter four, but starting at verse six, Paul says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us, right? We are the jars of clay. He is the treasure. Then he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Paul lives this way and can talk this way because he knows who lives inside him. And that's Christ. And when we know that Christ lives in us, we're not even scared in the face of death because who conquered death? Jesus. So in our literal body, in our physical body, the Bible literally says we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So that's why when we live by faith and others witness that, it, it's called a testimony. It's a testimony of the life of Christ that's being revealed in our body. So when we let go, when we let go of the control, when we let go and, and take a step back and allow God to live in us, that's how we witness to others about the good news of Jesus Christ because he, his death literally lives in our body so his life can be revealed through us. That's why we are dead. That's why when we rise to life in Christ, it is literally him in us. People are being a witness to who Jesus is through our body. Literally. This is not symbolic. This is a literal thing. If you allow it to be. <clears throat> wow. And when I read that this week, you know, I caught myself being worried, you know, about my future, about finances and yeah, just, just about, you know, things that I think a lot of people my age worry about. I, I, I don't have children and I, you know, I don't, I don't have other certain worries that you may be struggling with, you know, worried about your kids or your spouse or your, a job. But I think worry often runs through our minds. And I think it's very easy to fall into the lie that we don't have enough. I think we as people, when we are deceived and are not looking to Jesus, we believe in three lies. And it's the lie of I don't don't I don't have enough. I am not enough. 
or whatever I do have will be taken from me. So <clears throat> I don't have enough. That could be, you know, wanting a different body type, wanting a different face, you know, wanting, wanting things that you don't necessarily need, but you're believing in the lie that you don't have enough, right? Or the lie that I am not enough. So he doesn't like me because I don't look like this or they don't like me because I don't have this job or whatever, whatever. That's a lie. The third lie, that's when greed creeps in is, oh, I, I can't give because I don't have enough and I'm going to lose this. And if I give, then I'm going to be in loss or I'm going to be in lack. When the lies start to get in our head, we start to live this way. We live how we believe. And if you believe in any of those three lives, that's how you're going to live your life. But if you believe as Paul did, and if you believe that Jesus Christ literally lives in you, then you will always be enough. You will always have enough. And, you will, and nothing that is yours will be taken from you. Those, that is the difference between death and life. That is the difference of living in death and living in life. And we get the choice of how we want to live. So I had, I had a choice, right? I had a choice in my worries. You know, I could, I could choose to be worried, right? And then choose to go down this bunny hole of, oh, well, then I don't have this and I don't have that. How am I going to get this and how am I going to get that? Or I could literally stop and believe in the promise that God said, everything will be taken care of. He's always going to take care of me. You know, how Jesus said, you know, look at the birds. They don't worry. Or just ask and you will receive, right? If we believe in these literal promises because Christ lives in me, that I'm at peace. And in the back of my head, I knew that. In the back of my head, I knew I was always going to be taken care of, no matter what. Right? In the Psalms, it says, it says something. And I believe everyone's familiar with this verse, or maybe you're not. But it says, uh, blank will, uh, will praise the Lord. Everything that has blank. Will praise the Lord, and it's not everything that has a car. Will praise the Lord. It's not every every being that has a job. Will praise the Lord. Not every everyone that has a spouse will praise. It's not any of that stuff. It says everything that has breath will praise the Lord. God literally gives us a baseline of what to be grateful for. If you have breath in your body, then praise the Lord. It's not if you have a job, it's not if you have a, a spouse, it's not if you have kids, it's not if you have a nice house, it's not if you have a nice car, it's not if you have design or whatever, whatever. It's not any about, about any of that stuff, right? That we're constantly being fed in consumerism. It's everything that has breath. Oh, praise the Lord. And if you go back and you look at Paul, <laughs> Everything that has breath will praise the Lord. Meaning if you are alive and you are breathing, God has a plan for you. And you have the choice to live in death or to live in life. You can live in the lies of death and you could always be worried and you could always be stressed out. And you could live as the world lives because that's how the world lives. Or you can choose to live in life and believe that you are loved Believe that you are enough. Believe that you have enough. Believe that you are taken care of. Believe that even if you are hard pressed, you won't be destroyed. And even in the face of literal death, that you will rise again. Like this is how the Christian is supposed to live. This is how we're called to live. So the choice is yours, family. You can either live in peace or worry. It's a choice. And depending on what you believe, that's how you're going to live your life. And that is that witness that you're going to be to other people. So you can choose. Um, 
I just want to leave you with this. If you're interested in taking Bible studies, please contact us. If you're interested in getting baptized, please contact us. We would love to do those things for you. Or just talking. We are here to serve you. And I always love sharing my testimony and how I now believe that I am loved by my Father God. And because I believe that way, I live that way and it, I live good. I'm not rich, you know, I'm not wealthy or I don't have a lot of things, but I'm completely content and I'm completely blessed and, and satisfied because I know who my Father is and I know who I belong to. So, please contact us and we love you guys, so let us pray. I just want to pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just want to thank you so much again that um, you get to use me or, or I've accepted a call to be used by you. Lord, I ask that your blessing be on your people, that they may believe in who they are, that they may believe in whose they are, so that they can live good. That doesn't mean things will always be easy, but their belief will determine their life. And Lord, I choose to believe in you. I pray that for your people. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. Love you guys. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Bye. Thank you, Pastor Yesenia, for such a powerful and timely message. Pastor Meshach here, and I just want to thank each and every one of our viewers for taking the time to worship with us today on this Sabbath day. Look, if you want to sow a seed into South Bay's ministry, into evangelism, to Pathfinders Adventures, children's ministry, or maybe even our up and coming paddleboard ministry that's starting in June, simply just go to our website, southbaychurch.com, hit the online giving link, and then you could also sow a seed, whether it's paying your tithe or offerings, and we'll make sure your resources go to where it needs to be. Also, family, can you believe that it's been over one year now since the pandemic? As cases have been dropping, as things start to open up after June 15, we want to do our due diligence in making sure that we move into the next transition into church and worship in the way that God sees fit for us to do so. And so what we want to do is ask you to do two things for us. First is to pray. Pray for the leading of God's spirit to give us clarity, to give us direction, and to give us peace about what we will step into and how we would worship moving forward. The other thing is, if you go to our website at southbaychurch.com, there is a link for a regathering survey. Please take the time to give us your input, to share some of your thoughts on how you feel in us coming into in-person uh, services, worship services, the time of services, the type of protocols or things that you feel needs to be implemented, and all sorts of different things that we can make the best decision that is great and best for everyone. And so we're grateful that you would join us again this Sabbath. Please take the survey, so associated to our ministry, and remember family, live to bless others.